The House will be attentive to the regular calendar. <coughs> Majority of the Committee on Constitutional Review and Statutory Recodification, to which was referred House Resolution 13, an act repudiating opinion of the Justices 162, New Hampshire 160, 2011, and urging the Senate to remove from the table and pass 2011 House Bill 89. <coughs> Having considered the same, report the same with the recommendation that the bill ought to pass, Representative John W. Sabrowski for the majority of the committee. The minority of the committee, having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority report with the following resolution, resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate Representative Chris, Christopher W. Serlin from the minority of the committee. Uh, the chair recognizes the honorable member from Portsmouth, Representative Serling, to speak to the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon. Um, it's a, this is a House resolution that we're dealing with, so I don't want to take up a lot of time. The, as all of us know, a resolution doesn't carry the force of law anyway. I think everyone's already made up their minds on this bill. Um, if you believe the language of Part 1, Article 37, dealing with separation of powers, is quite clear, uh, and that its uh, position in the Constitution makes it clear that it's a very important concept in our system of government, then I would hope that you would vote no uh, on the question of ought to pass. I, the minority of the uh, committee believe this is a very straightforward question in that our state government does not allow, provide for one branch, even the legislative branch, to uh, specifically instruct the executive or judiciary to take specific actions in specific points of time. Um, I think it's a very straightforward question. I understand that a number of you will probably disagree. I am concerned, though, that a couple of weeks ago we suspended the rules of this House for purposes of introducing legislation, one of the pieces of which was this resolution. But it seems to me that if we were doing that, that this resolution would uh, seemingly be very critical to the people of New Hampshire in terms of its passage or otherwise. And nothing that we do here today is going to affect the citizens of New Hampshire in regard to this resolution. Uh, I think it probably should have waited until next year. I also uh, would ask all of you, when you're pressing your buttons, to consider the fact that if we have time in this chamber today to take up the question of a House resolution, which may or may not go to the Senate and they may or may not act on it, I, quite, I feel quite certain we have the time and energy to devote uh, ourselves to pending uh, vetoes, which need to be dealt with. So I would ask you to overturn the committee recommendation of ought to pass, and if you would, just read the blurb that I wrote. That's fairly straightforward. Does the member yield for a question? Certainly. The member yields for a question. The Honorable Member from Derry, Representative Manus, is recognized for a question to the Speaker. Thank you for, to the member for taking my question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Relative to uh, your, your separation of powers statement, isn't it true that the sentence quote, each principal ex executive department shall be under the supervision of the governor, quote, end quote, was removed from Part 2, Article 41 of the Constitution during the 1966 Constitutional Convention specifically to ensure that the legislature and not the governor maintain control over setting policy and directing the executive department's heads and the department's. Um, thanks for the question. I do believe that's what you believe. Um, I also believe that the language of Part 1, Article 37 is quite clear. Uh, separate and independent of means that one hand may not instruct specific actions on specific dates and specific policy matters. It, uh, this isn't about us passing a law that says it's illegal for one citizen to kill another and then asking the executive branch to enforce the law. Uh, we're taking a specific policy position, and the Supreme Court of the state ruled unanimously, and the opinion of over 30 former attorneys general and assistant attorneys general, both Republicans and Democrats, unanimously backed up that opinion when they also said this was an unconstitutional infringement of powers on the executive branch. So I understand that's your position, but I put my faith in Part 1, Article 37. Thanks. Does the member yield for an additional question? Yes. Member does yield. Representative Wiley recognized for a question of the speaker. 
I find it interesting that you say no branch can order another to take some action. How then did the Supreme Court order the legislature to fund education? Well, I'm not sure that the education funding debate is part of this bill that we're discussing right here. The, con the court is uh, provided the power through the Constitution to decide matters of legality vis-a-vis -vis the language of the Constitution. The chair recognizes Representative Bettencourt for purposes of a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in his remarks, the gentleman from Portsmouth wondered about whether or not this would go to the Senate. My understanding is, Mr. Speaker, and correct me if I am mistaken, this is a House resolution that does not go to the Senate, but in fact is a statement from the House only. Am I correct? You're correct. House resolutions do not go to the Senate for approval. They are a uh, resolution of the House, therefore a statement of the House. The question before the House is on the Majority Committee report of ought to pass as to House Resolution 13. The Chair recognizes Representative Itza to speak to the uh, report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You've heard that this resolution is about separation of powers. And it may surprise you. I agree. But it is also about the delegation of powers. And it is about making sure that the powers of the people stay to the branch of government that they were delegated to. Part 1, Article 37 says that in the government of this state, the three essential powers of government to which the legislative, executive, and judicial ought to be kept as separate from and independent of each other as the nature of free government will admit. And then it goes on. Or as is consistent with that chain of connection that binds the whole fabric of the Constitution in one indissoluble chain of connection of unity and amity. Therefore, you must ask yourself, what is that chain of connection? What does it tell me about the relative powers of the, in this case, legislative and executive branches? The power of the people to make law is invested in the legislature. In articles, part 1, articles 12, 29, and 31, and part 2, articles 2 and 5, the power of the people to stop the creation of law and to enforce the law is vested in the executive. In part 2, articles 41 and 44. The Constitution makes it clear that only the legislature has the power to put any law into force or to stop the enforcement or to, to take a law out of force. It also makes it clear that the only power to stop the creation of a law is with the executive. It goes on to say that the legislature has the power to define the duties, all the duties of the civil officers of the state. And finally, that the governor must enforce the laws, and he may do that by court action. Now, it seems in this case that the Attorney General and the Supreme Court are confusing the power to enforce the law by court action with the law itself, which in this case is to engage in a lawsuit. To take it literally, the governor could force the attorney general to engage in a lawsuit against Obamacare by requiring the attorney general to engage in a lawsuit against the attorney general. That's impractical. Both the Attorney General and the Supreme Court have said that the Attorney General can't be forced to engage in a lawsuit because of prosecutor prosecutorial discretion. Where does the Attorney General get his power? The legislature, RSA 7. The legislature would have equal power to define the duties and powers of the Attorney General as none. The Constitutional Review Committee has found that in the history of this state, this legislature has a history of, by statute or resolution, making many direct orders to the members of the executive, including 13 to the Attorney General. The Supreme Court acknowledges this, and they said we had that power until 1966 with the amendment to Part 2, Article 41. However, the last such order 
was in 1994 by then State Senator Shaheen, who ordered the Attorney General to engage in a lawsuit to take possession of C.V. Island. The Supreme Court relied on a segment of a quotation by Mr. Eaton in the 1966 convention. He was the uh, author of the amendment. But they ignored all his surrounding opinions, in which he stated the whole purpose of the amendment was to strengthen the power of the legislature relative to the executive and to make sure that the executive would always carry out the directives of the legislature. They also ignored the fact that a sentence was removed from the proposed amendment in order to make it crystal clear that the members of the executive report directly to the legislature. Now, if as the Supreme Court recognizes the general court, the legislature, had the power to make direct orders to the executive until 1966, and if, as the author of the amendment stated, the purpose of the amendment was to strengthen the legislature, then the legislature must still have the power to make direct orders to the members of the executive. If we do not pass H.R. 13, we will be enabling unelected bureaucrats to usurp and pervert the power of the people destroying their liberty. The wall of the Constitution which confines government and preserves liberty has been torn down one brick at a time. You have the power to rebuild that wall. Now is the day and the hour. It is a moment in history where you have the opportunity to hold the line, to defend liberty, I urge you to vote yes on ought to pass on H.R. 13. Thank you. The question before the House is the committee report of ought to pass on House Resolution 13. Representative Richardson requests a roll call vote. Is that sufficiently seconded? That is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Will members please take their seats? to come to order. The chair recognizes the honorable member from Hopkinton, Representative Richard, Gary Richardson, for purposes of a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the House has already expressed its opinion on this issue by the passage of HB 89, uh, but I also know that under our constitutional form of government, it is the Supreme Court that has the authority to determine the boundaries between executive and legislative authority, and that the Supreme Court has decided that not once but twice, uh, once for the original appeal and a second time with a motion for rehearing that raised all of the issues that the Honorable Representative from Fremont raised. And if I know that H.R. 13 goes beyond just expressing the opinion of this 
house, but does so in words that are insulting uh, and disrespectful to the Supreme Court. And I know that if we want the people to respect this house, we should not go on record using such language to criticize another co-equal branch of government. Would I then press the red button and vote against this disrespectful piece of legislation? Thank you. The question is on the committee report of ought to pass on House Resolution 13. The chair recognizes the member from Easton, Representative Sorg, for a parliamentary inquiry. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if you believe, as I believe, that the twin purposes of H.R. 13 are to acquaint the Senate with its right to disregard advisory opinions of the Supreme Court and to offer to the Senate reasons why it should disregard that, the advisory opinion in this case, and if you further believe, as I believe, that among the reasons to reject the advisory opinion in this case is that it enunciates a fundamentally dangerous and constitutionally inappropriate reallocation of authority between the legislative and executive branches. And if you also knew, as I know, that the Supreme Court itself has always recognized that in giving advisory opinions on proposed legislation, the justices do not act as a court, but as constitutional advisors, and that such opinions, therefore, are not binding upon either the court or the legislature in any future litigation. And if you therefore knew, as I know, that the minority report is legally incorrect in saying, as it does, that we know in advance what the outcome of any interbranch lawsuit is likely to be, and there is no chance of any outcome except what the court has already advised. If you knew all this, Mr. Speaker, would you then join me in voting yes to the motion of ought to pass by pressing the green button? Thank you. The question is on the majority report of ought to pass on House Resolution 13. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor of ought to pass, you will press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. To be attentive to the state of the vote, 258 members have voted in the affirmative, 112 in the negative. The committee report is adopted. The House will be further attentive to the regular calendar.